This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome, welcome. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Werber, your host for the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Best with Dr. Jeff. And of course, Instagram Live, here for you, here for your pets, here to talk about anything else you want to talk about when it comes to your pets. Now is the time. Free advice, nothing, you know, free is good. So <laughs> you come up with anything free. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch. This is free. So I uh, want your questions asked and um, we'd love to talk to you. So uh, how to get a hold of me very easily, uh, 877-385-8882. Once again, if you're on Pet Life Radio, 877-385-8882, or just go ahead and you're obviously here on air already, so just join me. And then here on Instagram, you're here. Just you know, type away. So heat stroke, it's a great question. In fact, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about on Talk Shop Live today. So let's get started. Let me just make sure I didn't miss any questions. Let's talk about heat stroke. So first of all, it is really, really serious. And you know, often it's us. We are creating the problem by how we exercise, when we exercise, and how for how long we exercise our dogs, especially during this heat. Here in LA today, I mean, I, early in the morning, my dogs get me up at five o'clock. And it was already warm as I'm going outside. Now the sun is shining, not a cloud in the sky. It's actually a gorgeous day, and it's going to be a hot one. So first thing is you have to read your dogs. So the issue is, Choose your best times to exercise, early morning and late evening. A couple things to remember, that late in the evening, the pavement is still really hot because the heat that gets in that black asphalt hangs in there for a while. So even though sun's going down at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, that past the pavement and asphalt can still be pretty hot. So you might want to think about more dirt, more grass, even sand at the beach gets really hot. As you know, you're going from you know wherever you're walking to the sand, you're going to cross to get down to the ocean. Just start running because it's hot. That heat is also affecting our dog's feet. Now, they got to remember one thing about dogs. They have only sweat glands as we do. So we regulate our heat by, of course, breathing, by sweating. They have the equine sweat gland only in the pads of their feet and their nose. If you hold up a foot to a nose, it's the same tissue. So that is not enough to regulate their body temperature. So what do they do? They pant. And Certain dogs, especially brachycephalic breeds, after a while have a really tough time panting because the back of the throat gets very swollen. So we need to read our dogs. We need to know how much they pant with normal and how much they're getting hot. Nothing you can do. And it, this takes a lot of time as far as just to feel it. I can tell whether a dog is febrile just when I'm petting them and touching their skin. You handle thousands of dogs, you're going to know kind of what's normal and what's not normal when this dog feels too hot, not too hot. But what you can do is when your dog's panting normally, put your hand in front of their mouth and you're going to feel hot air. Remember, dog's temperature is 101.5 to 102 point, 100, excuse me, 100.5 to 102.5 normal. And they're a little excited, a little, little tired. It can get, you know, panting a lot. It might get to 103. You want to feel what that heat feels like against your palm. When that actually starts feeling hot, we're talking 104, 105, 106 degrees. That's very critical. So you want to get that feeling. Read your dogs when they're sitting and panting a lot, when they're starting to slow down, when they're looking for areas to shade, when during a walk they keep wanting to sit down, their body is doing its job. It's telling them that they're too hot. But we have to read that and we have to stop. And we have to stop and take water breaks. One trick I do is I take a a, a bandana, wet it down, roll it up, and stick it in the freezer overnight. And then in the morning, if I'm going to take my dogs out, wrap that iced bandana around their neck. Again, make sure you have water with you at all times. Look for areas to stop and and take advantage of shade. Make sure they stop and have some water. It's our job because once they end up with heat stroke, we're talking 106, 107 degrees, and some dogs even 105 degrees, they will basically collapse. They will. So if you're hiking somewhere and you have a 70-pound dog, you're out of luck because you're going to have to carry them. Now, what about cooling them down with water? We used to do putting them in ice cold water. That's not good. You want to just use regular tap water, regular temperature, not ice cold, not cold, just regular water temperature, and do it slowly. That will help bring their temperature down, their fever down. And another thing you can do is take alcohol and rub it on their pads. Once again, we talked about how pads have that that equine sweat gland. That will draw 
a lot of fluid out. That will bring down their body temperature as well. Not too much, but just wet their wet the bottoms, the bottoms of their feet with alcohol, and that will help as well. But hose them down. Just take the regular outside water temperature how it comes out of your spigot. If you have a pool and you can bring them down to the pool, slowly submerge them. But you just got to really know them. The faster, the earlier you start to help control that temperature, the better off they're going to be. So keep that in mind as you are doing your job and trying to keep them cool. Uh, okay. Can you explain the importance of regular deworming cycle? That's a really interesting question. And how do often an older dog can take a bath? Well, okay. These are two questions. So let's get to the first one. Regular deworming cycle. This is where I probably have a different opinion than many. I, I think that monthly deworming is a moneymaker. It's, it's, it's not essential. First of all, we know that dogs, puppies often get worms. Of course, we run us. Now, I'll put, preface this. I'm not the kind of guy that will just deworm because it's a puppy. I'm going to want to know, first of all, what's the stool character? Stool is normal. The dog's acting fine. Okay. If I'm going to worm, deworm that dog, I'm going to test the feces first just to do it for the sake of doing it. I don't like throwing chemicals, even though they're safe. Yeah, they're safe. But I don't want to put chemicals with the dog just because someone tells me, well, you should you know, deworm them every month. Now, as adult dogs, oftentimes their own immune system is, I run fecal tests on many, 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 many adult dogs because of diarrhea. The only parasite I may see is Giardia. All right. I'm not seeing roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, whipworms. Now, if they're playing with a puppy, if there's a new puppy in the house and the puppy has worms, then yes. And the adult dog is having some diarrhea. Yes, I'm going to do a fecal. I'm going to check first. Am I going to worm without checking? No. I've never done it. I'm not going to do it. And now let's talk about the life cycle. Now, it gets a little complicated, a little technical here, but you got to follow along. All right. When we deworm, let's take the most common. Now, tapeworms, by the way, you can see those. You can see those better than we can see them because tapeworms don't usually shed eggs. When we're doing a fecal test, it's called a fecal float. We are looking for eggs, looking for coccidia, cysts. We're looking for eggs of the round hooks, whips. Tapeworms don't shed eggs. So we might get a negative and you're, you're seeing the little rice flakes coming out on the poop and hanging on the butt. And you're saying, well, doc, what are you telling me it's negative? I see the worms. That's because they're tapeworms. You'll see them. You'll make a diagnosis before we will. Just by seeing the tapeworm is enough of a diagnosis for me. Then, of course, we're going to deworm accordingly. But the other parasites have a cycle. And usually what we'll do is we'll worm them. And then two weeks later, we'll come back and worm them again. Why two weeks? Because when we worm them, we're going to be killing the adult worms. There may be some eggs left behind. Within two weeks, those eggs are going to become adult worms. We want to get those adult worms before they start shedding eggs. Now, deworming, 14 days later, a second dose, and you're good. Now, what happens with these once a month wormers? Why it's such a gimmick. It's so unnecessary. You're taking a safe drug and you're worming. If you wait a full month, remember the life cycle, you're going to kill the adults, but you wait a full month, the eggs left behind are then going to hatch, grow it to adults, and those adults are going to lay eggs. That happens within a month. So if you continue and do the second worming or do it once a month, you're going to have to continue to do it once a month. However, if you take that same medication and do it two weeks later, you're done. So that's what I'm saying. It's a gimmick. I'm not a fan. Uh, you want to do worming, do a fecal test, worm them properly, you know, the right medication, the right parasite, and you'll probably take care of it for good. Now, what are some of the complicators? A dog who likes to eat feces is eating stool all the time, but getting diarrhea, getting sick, test them. If they, are, if they have worms, deworm them accordingly, appropriately. And you're, again, you won't have to do it all the time. So that is my thought. Uh, how do you recommend an older dog take a bath? Well, I don't like to dry them out. I'd say max for me. Now, let's assume we have a somewhat healthy dog with no major skin disease, no major skin infection, not, no bacterial infection, no yeast infection. Just because they get dirty, you can bathe them. You could bathe them once a week if you are kind of neurotically crazy, you want to be clean all the time and you have a little Maltese or a little white poodle and you don't like getting, them getting dirty, you could bathe them with a mild shampoo. I have an aloe oat, for example, is great once a month. Now, I mean, excuse me, once a week. Now, could for safety, just to do it routinely, I'd say once a month is fine, unless you have other reasons. The skin is very dry. The, skin, the dog gets dirty all the time. It's always running around, playing in the mud. 
Yes, you could safely bathe once every week to once every other week. More than once a week, I say for dogs that have really major skin infections, where I'm going to bathe them, I'm going to soak them, I'm going to let them sit in soak for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then rinse them off there really well. Now think about why it's important to let that medicated shampoo sit. I'm, for example, when I do my for real shampoo, which is chlorhexidine, ketoconazole, so that it's, it's antifungal, antibacterial. Think about this. Think about I'm having a little sore and you want to put a triple antibiotic on it, like a neosporin. So you rub it in and one minute later, you wipe it off. What good did it do? Nothing. So when you're going to use a medicated shampoo, it's got to sit on the skin for enough time to actually get in and do its job. So keep that in mind. When you, you know, you see, I see people take the groomer, they lather them up, sit and then right so done, they're lathering, rinse them off again. That didn't accomplish anything. So very important to, uh, if you're going to do it, do it right. All right, let me wave a little bit here. Hello, B. I know you're gonna. She's gonna comment. I'm sitting up. My other set was getting too cluttered, and my, my people that, that I work with, especially when I I do my talk shop live, they definitely got to clean it up. So I kind of created a, a new little set. I'm gonna put something here in the background, look really cool, but I think it looks better. But uh, my my sister always yells at me because I uh, seem to hunch over. I'm trying to set up straight, Beth, but uh, it doesn't always work. But anyway, uh, th this is for you. All right because I'm going straight to Talk Shop Live at 10. All right. Um, let's see. I see a lot of waving people come. I'm glad. God, I want some questions. Ah, Eloise, I told you they start panting with the tongue to the side. You know, I, I'm sure Eloise is talking about, again, our discussion about heat stroke. Yeah, I mean, just panting in general. What she's saying is dogs that don't loop usually like this, because they, why? Because they're getting very weak. And it's hard to keep the tongue straight. So it's almost like the tongue is just, it's just outside the mouth flopping. And for me, just the heavy panting is enough. But yes, you know, again, that's why it's so important to know your dogs, know how they react, know how they respond, because that's when you're going to run problems. When there's so every dog is a little bit different. So if you don't actually know what and how your dog responds to certain situations, then you won't know what, when their abnormals are. So in order to know what the abnormals are, you really need to know your, your dogs, your cat's normals. And that's, uh, that's important. All right. So here is a good question. And right up my alley as well. Why do you think pugs and Frenchies get such a bad rap in the media regarding their health? As an owner of both, I never hear the media talk about the other pedigree dogs and their health issues. Well, first of all, I don't think it's so much pugs. The pugs we know, because pugs have been around as a very popular breed way longer than the Frenchies as far as popularity. So they're brachycephalic. Their ears are a problem. Their breathing, certainly a problem. I see a lot of Frenchies. I have Frenchies. I'm on my third. I, I know that they often need the surgery, the, the soft palate surgery, the nary surgery. Interestingly, pugs and some of the other brachycephalic breeds who are also have that pushed in face, they rarely need that. Even the English bulldogs with the really pushed in faces, they don't need it. For some reason, it's the French bulldog, whether it's a breeding issue. So that's one thing, the, the respiratory issues, but they also have very, very severe skin issues, the Frenchies. Many of them are allergic to chicken, beef. They're always looking for special foods for the Frenchies. They have their ear problems. They have their skin problems because of their skin folds, especially around the face, the nose, their tails. They got that weird corkscrew tail that often that is a problem. It often needs a surgical correction. I look, I love them. And behaviorally, they are the funniest things on the planet. I mean, uh, we're riding, they're riding skateboards. All you have to do is go on and like an internet or a TikTok, you're going to see the cutest darn things about Frenchies. They do the funniest things. But also, I think you're seeing a lot in the media because they have become so popular. Frenchies now are the number one dog in America. They overtook the Labrador Retriever, for God's sakes. That tells you how popular and, and um, how special many people think they are. Or else, you wouldn't see so many Frenchies. So I adore them. I do have concerns. I think they're being overbred right now. So a lot of these problems that were minor problems are becoming major problems because they're just, they're being overbred. So a lot of the bad traits, the skin disease, the skin infections, the degree. Also, another thing we get with these is the, is the corneal ulcers. My son's Frenchie just had one. They, because of their prominent bug eyes, think about this. When a normal dog is going through brush, Okay. And their snout's out to here. So when their snout starts feeling something, they respond by closing their eyes, protecting their eyes. But the brachycephalic breeds with the short snout, by the time they feel it in their snout, it's already hit their eyes, which is why these dogs often will get corneal problems, ulcer problems, 
There's also called the stromal defects, which is for healing issues, healing ulcers. I mean, they they have a lot of issues. Now, what it used to be, we used to, from a veterinary standpoint and skin, we say sharp haze where the veterinarians delight because they get so many problems. Now, now I think Frenchies are just taking over for that as well. But I do do love them, and they are they really are fun, great dogs. And most often, they're very, very friendly. Now, when you look at the, the three dogs that I find are very similar, you got the Frenchie, the Boston, and the, the Pug. I say the Pugs are, I say the happiest dogs on the planet. Frenchies are really great. Of all of them, the Boston Terrier, and I've had a lot of very mean Boston patients. So uh, I know some are great, and but they could be a little tough. Anyway, on that note, we're going to take our break. We're, we're 20 minutes into the show. Don't go away. Here on Pet Life Radio, we have to run our commercial breaks. Stay tuned. Stay on uh, here on uh, Instagram Live, and I'll talk to you while the commercial is going on. So don't go away. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hey, we're back live on Pet Life Radio. We just had a, a question about chickens. Uh, I have a hen that thinks it has been brooding for at least a month. It's just too long. I will tell you that my experience with chickens is less than the thimble full, but I can get answers for you. So let me take that and talk to some of my bird people and see what they think. Before we get to the Eloise question, the 12-year-old dog, only thing is ever recently is an ear infection. Anything I should do for him? Okay. Now, first of all, let's talk about the heat again. One thing that I want to make clear, that shaving a dog down during the hot weather is really not a recommended thing to do. That coat, especially in those thick coated Arctic breeds, the Samoyeds, the the Malamutes, the Huskies, the Akitas, they're built for this. And that coat will keep them warmer in cold weather, but it also protects them from the heat in hot weather. It's like a thermos. In cold, it doesn't let their body heat go out. In the heat, it doesn't let the outside heat come in. So you're taking a dog that was naturally built for protection, and you're going to shave them down. That's not a good idea. Now, does the coat need to be healthy? Yes. These animals should be brushed well during the hot weather, but don't necessarily think that you need to shave them down. So uh, my recognition is don't do it. Now, 12-year-old dog, the only thing is ever recently is an ear infection. Anything I should be doing for him? Changes food, less walks. Now, are you talking about doing for him in the heat or in general? In general, when you have animals that have persistent ear infections, my recommendation is just put on your list of things to do, just like you do with anal glands or toenails or brushing teeth, ear cleaning. Put it on your list of things to do on a regular basis. And that's what, it's, um, that's what I think you should do. It's not something that it's not going to affect that. Now, if you think the ear infections are secondary to the heat, then uh, it's it's uh, the walks. Now, food, that's a different thing. Um, walks is probably not going to be the issue. Food, however, when dogs have food allergies, it seems that the organs most affected are their feet and their ears. So if you have that, they'll also sometimes rub their face along a wall or a carpet or on furniture. But if you have dogs that seem to get persistent ear infections and are continually going after their feet and it's not seasonal, it's happening all the time, then 100%, I would put uh, your list of differentials a food allergy. And then it's time to talk to your veterinarian, go on to do a, a food trial. It's called the elimination trial. You're going to start either eliminating everything by feeding a pure hypoallergenic diet, like a hydrolyzed protein diet, or something called ZD Ultra, which is a, just a protein fragments instead of whole proteins. And that's good. Or a novel protein with single antigen. 
And that is a food that only has one protein, and it's a protein that the dog has probably never been exposed to, such as venison or rabbit or tilapia, cod, salmon, bison, kangaroo, something that, that we, we don't usually use in, in dog foods. Doing this trial, which would be minimum six weeks, eight weeks better, you need to be extremely strict. That means no other treats, nothing but that one protein. If you throw anything else at them that they may be sensitive to, they're going to break out and you're going to say, oh, well, there's allergic to, to kangaroo or to, to rabbit also. No, it's your, you cheated. If you're going to do it, you got to do it well. You got to do it right. All right. What's your recommended dog food? God, that's like me telling you what my recommended ice cream is. When it comes to dog food, first of all, it's going to sound so trite. Food is overrated. Okay. Yes, it's, of course, it's important. Good nutrition. There are so many foods out there, just like there's so many ice creams out there. And what I like, you may not like. People love McConnell's, for example. I think it's okay. I don't like it. It's too fat, too fatty, and it sticks to the roof of my mouth. I'm not a fan. But so when it comes to food, here are my criteria. Very simple. Number one, number one, very simply, your dog's got to like it. Your cat's got to like it. If they're not going to eat it, I don't care how good it is, how natural, how organic, how expensive. It's not good. Number two, do they, does it leave them with a nice shiny coat? Do they have good bowel movements? All right. Do they keep their energy? So if they, all those are check, check, check. And then also, of course, you want to make sure that at, at the very least, the food is AFCO certified, the Association of American Feed Control Officials, because you know that a lot of these off brands, they're not AFCO certified. They haven't gone through any kind of testing trials. I'm not a fan. But most, most foods, you'll see, you'll see what's called an AFCO statement. Have an AFCO statement. That takes care of the, the dog part of it. Now let's take up your part. If you have to drive 30 miles to, because one pet store in the whole region has it, ooh, you don't need that. If it's so expensive that you're giving up on other things in life because you got to feed your dog, no. There are great choices in every price range and every availability and convenience. So you want to pick the right thing. Don't get sucked in by a commercial or someone telling you that this is the best. There is no the best, period. So find out what fits your needs, your pet's needs. They like it. I've said so many people, I'm not going to mention brand names, but it was one of the bigger brands 40, 30 years ago. And I, my sister will know this very well. She was told that if they don't feed after she got her Doberman, if they don't feed this food, then the, the guarantee is null and void. What kind of nonsense is that? Well, interestingly, now that same food is available in the supermarket and it happens to be a very good food. But to say that you have to feed this one food, that's nonsense. So trust me, there are many choices out there. Take advantage of them and feed what fits your needs. Feed what your dog likes feed that your cat likes, feed that their bathroom habits are good, that their coat is nice and shiny, they have lots of energy, that food is just fine. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. I, it's one of those things I get all the time, and it's just so annoying that people say, no, you got to do the best. There is no best. Is there a good no-rinse shampoo for dogs with heart? You know what? There are some, they say waterless or whatever, uh, sudless shampoos. I, I personally haven't had experience with them. I, what I would say is I, I can't imagine it hurting. If it helps you keep your dog cleaner, bathe more regularly, your dog is okay with it. My fear is it makes a, leaves a residue of some sort. Maybe I'm wrong. Then try it. I mean, if it brushes out and, and the coat is super nice and shiny and soft afterwards, your dog doesn't mind, give it a shot and then do me a favor. Reach back to me. Uh, come on next week and, or whenever you try it and let me know. That would be good. Know your dog, do training that connects you to your dog. That's, that's true. And as I say, you, you have to know your dog and, and even training your dog. That's why there's no one training technique that's going to work for every dog. And I'm sure Vicky at Eloise will agree. You have to know the dog, see the dog, see what the problems are. And you have to use, it's like with kids. There's no one way to discipline a kid to ha work every single time. You got to customize it to your own kids. Good supplements for cats. You know, again, cats are meat eaters. They have to have meat. Uh, as far as supplements, if they are doing fine and you checked all those boxes and their bathroom habits are great and they have energy and they're cuddling with you and they're purring and they are, they like their food. When you take them into the vet, the vet says, wow, he or she's in great shape. Then do you really need a supplement? Now, there are 
good supplements out there. I'm a fan, as I told you, of certain things. Like I'm a, I, I like probiotics. I take vitamins. I don't know if I need them or not. I take them every day and I take my CoQ10 and I, I take my Juniatin, which is a, an NAD plus promoter in the body. And I, I do my glucosamine. I don't know if I need it or not. But you know what? It makes me feel good. And I think I'm, I'm keeping myself in pretty decent shape for my age. So therefore, is it my genes or is it what I take every day? I don't know. Am I going to stop? No. <laughs> I keep going because it's working. So, but yeah, you, there are, I don't know by name brands. There's one called Petinic, which is a liquid, easy to give a cat. See, you know, cats are hard. You know, cats are really hard to, um, now if you can get a chew and they, they like it, you know, if you, if you eat dogs are sometimes difficult to work with and give a pill, try giving a pill to your cat. So anyway, uh, but yes, it, there are, are some things out there. All right. So it is time that I go. So let me tell you in a half hour, I'm going to go live again. You're going to join me on my talk shop live. It's a show where I'm going to do some education. Some of these things we're going to talk about and uh, bet, I'll give this and end here. And oh, to the best, I love this. It's great. Okay. And best supplement, anything with glucosamine and chondroitin, it helps over the counter. I'm a huge proponent of these things as a preventive as well. So I have my flex. You can go to Amazon and get my flex. That's F-L-E-X-X by Dr. Jeff, or it says performance by Dr. Jeff. But trust me, it's not the only one. There are many, many good uh, products out there. Uh, best over-the-counter product for summer allergies in dogs. Well, there is really... For true allergy, if it's true allergy, pollen allergies, there may be something over the counter on the natural side, but of course, flea control. But the two over the counter flea products that used to be great are no longer that great. They're still safe, but fleas have been developed resistance. Those are the fipronil products and the imidacloprid products. The name brands I'm not going to give you, but you can look them up imidacloprid and fipronil. The products themselves are very safe, they just lost their efficacy. Unfortunately, you need to see your veterinarian for the really bad. The isoxazolines are much more effective to control the fleas and ticks. As far as allergies, you can try an old-fashioned antihistamine. Those are the ones that kind of keep the dog down a little bit. Also, if they're very agitated and scratching a lot, chill, my chill medication, again, available on Amazon. It's really good. Or come to Dr. Jeff and you can get them from me. It's valerian, passionflower, chamomile, melatonin, but that just keeps the dog calm. As far as true anti-allergy over the counter, there's really not enough on the, on the Western medicine side, but there may be some things on the naturopathic side I'm just not aware of, but uh, you can do some homework, uh, right? Do you make regular shampoo for dogs? Yes, I do. I do. The regular shampoo. Come to Talk Shop Live. Follow me up. I have For Real. I have Aloe Oats. I have What Inch. I have a lot of good shampoos. And anyway, this is fantastic. These are being fed dry. Kibble. Yes, big dogs do okay being dry. Look, my dogs, sometimes they don't like the canned food that much. They much prefer the kibble. All right. I got to go, guys, because I have another show coming up. What are good fostering dogs? So I'll tell you, my life with corgis. Can you come back next week? Promise me. And uh, let's do this screen. Sunscreen for dogs. That is, yes, is the short answer. Look for SPF 50 or greater. Get the sprays. It's much easier. And the bellies where they don't have a lot of hair. So we're talking about the snout, the ear tips and cats, especially the, the, um, uh, on the foreheads of cats. We call the frontal lobe area. That's important. Uh, yes, you want to get some things there. All right. And I think that is all I have time for at this show. So- Thanks for joining me here on Pet Life Radio. And thanks for joining me on Instagram Live. Once again, uh, you'll be getting an alert if you want to come back live at 10 o'clock. I start my talk shop live show, talk about some products. But again, you know me, I didn't become a veterinarian to push products. I came a veterinarian to help people with their pets. So we're going to do a lot of talking. You're going to ask questions as well. So anyway, yes, I am attending Super Zoo. I will be there certainly Wednesday, Thursday, and probably leave you the late Thursday night or early Friday morning. So I'll be there for the first two full days. And I think that is it. This is fantastic. You guys have been the best audience ever and love it. So I appreciate it. And we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Same back time, same back channel here on Instagram, here on Pet Life Radio. And if you can join me at 10 o'clock, please do. See you then. Bye-bye. Let's Talk Pets every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.